Hello guys, how you doing? Beautiful day here in Alabama today. The sun has come out. I hope you're having a beautiful day where you're at. Spring is coming, guys. Oh, well, we're going to get into some deep, interesting, intricate, detailed information today about some very amazing things about the lineage of Jesus Christ, about the capital of the world, about Jerusalem and the Melchizedek priesthood and the great city of Melchizedek and Adonai Zedek and David, the high priest of Melchizedek and where he came from and Bethel and uh, Rahab the harlot, the, the, Rahab the dragon lady who was the harlot in Jericho, which is 24 miles from Jerusalem. We're going to get into a lot of stuff. You know, I mean, it's just going to be eye-opening. So, I have said that Jesus was a son of Joseph. <laughs> and I have given my reasons, some of the reasons, and we've talked about all kinds of different reasons. But today I'm going to try and put all that together to kind of make it a little bit more understandable. Really want to put all this together because if I'm, what I'm saying is true, that Jesus was the son of Joseph, then why do, do we have in the Bible two accounts, one in Matthew chapter 1 and one in Luke chapter 3, which gives us the genealogy of Jesus. Both of which give us what appears to be the genealogy from Judah. So we have two genealogies where Jesus is the son of Judah. Well, of course, Jesus is the son of Judah in some legal way. The Bible does not, on the outside, doesn't give us a genealogy back to Joseph. So how do we know that Jesus was born of Joseph? And how could he be born of Joseph and Judah? Well, we've, we've already talked, I don't know how many times, about the book of Ruth. Because remember, Ruth married Boaz. But Ruth, Boaz wasn't initially one of the lineal descendants that would lead to the Messiah. He ends up becoming that. Originally, it was Elimelech and Naomi. We have pointed out that Naomi is really just another kind of slight misspelling of Naamah. In other words, the Bible is very clever. It uses names to remind you of a, an ancestor. So to, to, to let you know who this person is, Naomi. She's a woman. And there are several of these women that it tells you is a, a mother of the lineal descendant of, of the Messiah. Now her husband is a Limelech. But Naomi, we don't know who she is. It doesn't give her genealogy. She could have been probably just about anybody because after all, um, Judah marries some prostitute called Tamar. Joshua marries Rahab, some harlot, a high priestess of Jericho, which is the Canaanite priesthood. Remember, Moses married into the Jethro's priesthood. He was a herder of Jethro's sheep and married a Mary or a Miriam. Miriam is a plural. And they all seem to be marrying, marrying Marys. Including Osiris who uh the story of Osiris is that he had two sit. There were two sisters from Beth Anu. One is Mary and one is Murti. In our Bible, La Osiris, Lazarus, Osiris has two sisters, Mary and Martha. So all of this is important. Words are important, and they tell a big story. Now, it you know obviously some people could be named the same as somebody else and it may not have anything to do with that other person. But 
In the Bible, we can almost 99% sure that if there's a, a name, it it's supposed to remind you of someone. So Naomi is Naama, one of these, the, the seed of the woman. Why is she the seed of the woman? Well, she's a woman and her husband is Noah. And therefore, Noah's genealogy goes back to Seth, who took the place of Abel because Cain killed him. But Cain became a wanderer in the earth and had several children, just the same number of kids that Seth had, all the way down to a woman. The last person that it mentions from the line of Cain is Naamah. The rabbis tell us that Noah had a wife, a different wife, but she died and he took his concubine. Isn't that interesting? The lineage of Seth were the ruling class and they had slaves from Canaan, from Cain. So they had concubines and Noah had a concubine, Naama. Well, Noah took her on the boat with him. Now, of course, Shem, Ham and Japheth were not of the bloodline of Cain, neither one of them, neither, not any of them, not any of these three. When Ham saw his father's nakedness, it means he slept with his father's wife, and that brought the child Canaan into the world, which carried on the line of Cain from Naamah. But Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were from their mother. They, they lived a hundred years before the flood, give or take a few years, because there were different ages. But we find, and we've done some, we've talked about this before, it looks like Japheth might have been the eldest. Now, they were all born from Noah's wife, and we don't have her name. But their mother died. Remember, she was probably six, seven hundred years old, so she died pretty old. Noah was six hundred when the flood came. That's Atlantis. Noah lived there for six hundred years. And as we've said, this is coded. Adam lived 930 years, but in the Sumerian Egyptian text, these are thousands of years. So we don't know the exact dates, but we know that Atlantis was hundreds of thousands of years. And the king of Atlantis was Noah for half of the time of our genealogy in the, in our Bible. You know, Adam probably reigned a long time. He lived almost a thousand years when he quit reigning. Right about the time that Adam died, well, Enoch, his, the seventh in line, who the book of Enoch says would become the Messiah, and Enoch got all this knowledge, this amazing knowledge, went to heaven, talked with Enlil and Anu. Yeah, and Enlil and Anu granted Adam eternal life. But Inki in the Sumerian, Ia Inki in our Bible, Ia Anoki, as it says in Exodus 20 and verse 1. Yeah, that's the name of Yahweh, Ya Anoki, or Ya Inki. He tricked Adam into not partaking of the tree of life. So, Adam probably lived until he was very old as the king of Atlantis. Now, our Bible says there was a world of old that was destroyed. A heavens and an earth that was, that was destroyed in the days of Noah. And then there was a new heavens and a new earth. But the heavens and the earth that was, they was they were destroyed by water. So remember, we're looking forward, as we said yesterday, to a new heavens and a new earth. Does it mean the globe will no longer be the stars will perish? No. It means the, the, the whole world can, can exist in different aeons. And all of the aeons, there are 12, they come in succession and we're in the last aeon. A group of aeons is, they're, they're bunched into 12 aeons, 2,000 years each, and that makes 24,000 years. When that's over, we start an entire 
and completely different world or cosmos or another system of things is what that can be translated. Cosmos, order of things, order, cosmetic arrangement. And so we know that the Great Pyramid is over 10,000 years old, BC, 10,000 BC. So that's about 12,000 years ago. Actually, we'll see it's about 14,000 years ago from today here in a minute. That the flood happened. We know that from archaeology and other, you know, manuscripts and so forth. So our Bible makes it look like it was only about two, three thousand years since Noah, since the flood. But it's really been 12,000 years. And the Great Pyramid existed before the flood. And it's called the Pillar of Enoch. And so it has on, in the inscriptions, the hieroglyph or the holy writing is the writing of Enoch. He's also called by the Romans Mercury and by the Greeks Hermes. So, in our Bible is Enoch. And this is going to be the person who would become the Messiah. He was taken, or he was not, he lived 365 years, which is coded. All these dates are coded. 365 is how many days there is in a year. So he lived an entire circle circuit he reigned because he is the lord for the entire age that then was under atlantis <clears throat> obviously he reigned under his father adam so for a period of time adam until while enoch was learning and growing and for a while he wasn't even born yet because he was the seventh person that came along so it was several hundred years and then he was born so adam reigned for some period of time and once adam was too old he probably wanted to give it to Enoch. But remember, when Adam died 930 years, that's about the time that Enoch was 365 years old and he was taken to heaven. So when Adam went and died, that's the same time that Enoch took 144,000, as it says in the book of Jubilees, and went to heaven. And that's the city of the divine being that's in heaven. It was taken up. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, we see it coming down out of heaven. And there's all the 144,000 and everything else. So after Adam left or died and Enoch was not, for the Lord took him, somebody else took over and that would be Noah. Noah became the king. Noah is Anu. And so the world that then was, was destroyed by water. And now we're living in a different world now. It's called a different age. But it's also, remember, it's been 12,000 years. So an entire 24,000 years have gone by because it wasn't the whole 24,000 years when it sunk. It was about halfway. Because remember, Atlantis is down there in the water. The Aquaman, Pisces, and uh, January, which is a place of water because there is a sea beast there. So all of that bottom part of the wheel on the left side of the bottom part of the wheel is all water. There's three houses, three days and three nights. The other three days and three nights with Scorpio, Sagittarius, and Libra, that's the bottomless pit, a place of, you know, burning and hell, a pit. And that's why there's scorpions and serpents and, and uh, these... Sna there's snakes down there, serpent, serpent, the serpent uh, constellation. And that's where Judas Iscariot uh, kisses the sun, and it, he's, he's a scorpion. Judas Iscariot was a scorpion. It symbolizes him. That's the house that he rules. And the little, the end of the, the tail of the scorpion stings the sun all the way up. When it's starting to go down over the horizon, it's the kiss of death. He betrays the sun and the sun dies. So, the ages that starts, you know, the year starts in the spring. So, we had the golden age thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And... That is something in the primordial past we we don't even understand. It's just thousands of years ago. 
But where Atlantis began is you look at where fall would be, where Libra is, and <clears throat> the world started going downward. That's when sin began to get bad, and it symbolizes mankind going into this, you know, the fall of Atlantis. And mankind went down into this travail, down into Egypt, building these three-dimensional, four-dimensional buildings, these pyramids. And so, we went first through the marshes until we found, at the bottom, this beast, the sea beast, or Leviathan. And remember, the Leviathan is kind of represented as a dragon, and there are, as we've said, there are two serpents in the garden. These are called seraphim. They each have six wings and they hover and encircle the mercy seat. Six wings on each side. One is the dark side and one's the light side. So on the bottom of the wheel is winter and that's the fall of man because in Atlantis, which was on the top of the wheel, the golden age, as it began to fall and decline, so Adam lived up, up in Leo, that was the glory, and then began to the, the kingdom began to fall with his children going it down into the world, and you know even Jesus is represented going down into Egypt. So I'm saying all this because I want to just give a basic idea that the fall of Atlantis has two stages. Okay, when the Atlantis sunk, according to Plato. That's what our Bible is talking about, the Great Flood. And that happened like 12,000 12, B.C., so about like 14,000 years ago, because we're now already 2,000 years past the beginning of spring when Christ came or the sun began to rise on the horizon and come up out of the hell. He was the firstborn among many brethren. We're all following him. Remember, Zeus... Um, went in and got his brethren, that's all of us, out of the his father Kronos or Satan or the darkness. And he got us out and that's us going around from the bottom of the wheel and then rising on the horizon out of hell, conquering death. And then we became the rulers. We're becoming the rulers now. We're going back up into the top of the wheel like... <clears throat> Back in the golden age, we'll have another golden age and we'll reign for thousands of years up there. But there will be one specific reign for a thousand years that the Bible talks about, as we've said, that will have a, a specific ending. There'll be another cycle. But for the most part, we're going to be progressing for thousands of years. Now, we won't ever have to go back around and then go back down through the waters again and become fish and and birds and mammals and men and start all the way through transmigration and advancing. We won't ever have to do that again because it doesn't go around in a circle, come back, same spot. Everything goes in a vortice or a DNA or a, an advancing pattern. So by the time we get up into the heights of the thousands or the ruling forever and ever, we'll be like the stars and each star different star and glory. We'll each have our own glory and we'll go and eternally progress. So the fall of Atlantis was 14,000 years ago. And I think I got a little deep and got into the thick of some of the woods there. But what I was going to say is that the Great Pyramid is like 14,000 years old and it may have stood for, I don't know, thousands of years before that because we know that Enoch built it. So we don't know when the Great Pyramid was built, but it was thousands and thousands of years ago. Well, the flood came about 14, 12, 14,000 years ago. And so it is a monument, a witness that stands, and the writing is from before the flood back to the days of Atlantis. So you've heard a lot of speculation as to why did they build the pyramid and who built it and how. Well, that's the explanation. You're not going to find any other buildings anywhere in the world except the Great Pyramid that's going to be exactly like that one because that particular one was built literally to survive the flood to preserve the ancient wisdom that then was written down 
by someone named Canaan. His son was Shiloh, which is the the city of Jerusalem where they put the, these words down in a book. And we have pieces of it today. And it's called the Bible. And it's how we got the information about our history. But it's written in code in the stars and in this book. It is the great pyramid that is a great monument to the Lord that tells us about our ancient history back to Atlantis, the pillar of Enoch, the pillar of Jesus Christ, the Lord of this world. And the writing was written either by Jesus, Enoch, or by his scribes, of course, who chiseled it in the rock. But it was the knowledge of Enoch, and it's called the pillar of Enoch. Now, the reason I tell you that is because in the book of Jubilees, there is a particular person who finds this monument. Called, it's called a rock, but I believe it's an, a pyramid that he finds. And on this pyramid is written some mysterious writing that it says in the book of Jubilee specifically is about astrology. It was all written down in this ancient language that they didn't understand. So whatever language the Hebrews, because we're going to show that it's the, the father of Hebrew or the grandfather of, of Eber the, that started the Hebrews, whose name is Melech, whose father was Canaan, who, Canaan, who found this rock that had astrology and knowledge of the sun and the moon and stars and all these things. And he, he found it, and he had a child, and that child's name was Shelah, or Shalom, which means peace. It's spelled different ways. It's also the city that we call Jerusalem that was ruled over by Melchizedek. Now, we'll find out why it was ruled over by a man named Melchizedek. Who is that? Some say it was Shem. Well, according to the Septuagint chronology, it couldn't be Shem. There isn't enough time in there. The way that they have the dates, it couldn't be Shem. And we know it wasn't Shem because it says in the Book of Jubilees who it was. Canaan is the one who found the rock or the pyramid and got this knowledge. <clears throat> he then started a priesthood. He learned what it was supposed to have been written on by the watchers. And he learned this information and it was handed down. Anyway, he married a woman and they had a child that married a woman named Melech. Okay, that's where we get the word king. It's where we get this deity Molech, Melech, or Melchizedek. So, the Melchizedek priesthood comes and stems from this child, which is the son of Arpachshad, the son of Shem, the son of Canaan, who is Sheba. And this is what the prophecy says, that Judah will have the scepter and will not depart from beneath his feet until he who comes who has the legal right, which that word is Sheba, until Shiloh come, until the peace comes. So, it's not, it's, it's a play on words. Everything in the Bible is a play on words. A person's name means more than just the name. It's a title. And the one who comes is a real person. Noah was a real person, but he's also the deity of this world. Adam's not the deity of this world, although I believe that Noah could be a reincarnation of Adam. But Noah is the first or the father of the deities. Anu or Noah or Aranos, who is the father of this world. Why? Because the world that then was, that was back in the days of Atlantis before the flood, perished. And now we're have, and there was a new heavens and a new earth. And this world, this cosmos was ruled over by this Noah. And Noah had ruled in the world before, prior, for thousands of years, because he was 600 years old when it came. So his sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem were also deities and when they married mortals which is the children of Cain and this is the story of Ham seeing his father's nakedness the story of Kronos uh, castrating his father Uranus or Anu and we're going to find who these characters are in our Bible along with and in cross reference with the book of Jubilees now the problem is is that some of this has been taken out of the Bible the Masoretic scribes took out this one kid named Canaan who is Canaan why is it called the land of Canaan? Well, it's spelled slightly different than Canaan. But again, words mean things. Just like Naamah and Naamah. 
or Naomi. Well, Naomi's husband was Elimelech. That means El Melech. So El Melech was the deity of Molech. And it's a lineal priesthood. <clears throat> now, yes, this Elimelech then has a, a, a was the Melchizedek priesthood. And he dwelt where? In Shiloh. And when Shiloh comes, he who comes who has the legal right, he would be the ruler, the Messiah, who is Joseph. Joseph was of Ephraim, and Shiloh was in the territory of Ephraim. Right? It's right on the border. 20 miles over the line is Jerusalem, which is in Judea. And this is the circuit. And this is right near Bethel and Jericho. Joshua then marries a woman in the genealogy. Mary's genealogy. Why is it Mary's genealogy? Because it's also Jericho, or, or I should say the, the Melchizedek priesthood genealogy. Because it, it follows the, the, the woman seed, or Naamah, the, 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 the daughter of Cain. And so there's going to be a combination. So if we look at the book of Jubilees, we're going to find that the Melchizedek priesthood is a combination of all three sons. Japheth, Ham, and Shem. They're all in there. But the male comes from Shem. And then there are two females, the line of the woman, that comes from both Japheth and from Ham. And this is why this story that we had, we did the whole video the other day about um, the Titans being the Amorite right, Ugaritic text word for Dedan, or Dan. Dan is a tribe in Israel that was named after these titans because Dan conquered Tyre. We'll get into that here in just a minute. We've already discussed some of this, but we're going to do this in detail. Now let me show you this book of Jubilees. It's very interesting. Well, before I do that, just briefly, I want to share this. So in our Bible, in Mary's genealogy, it says... This is the genealogy of Jesus, who was, according to law, it says in the Greek, according to the tradition, which nobody quite knows exactly what that means. They think maybe it means he was adopted. He was a son of Joseph. Now, it doesn't say son of Joseph like it normally does. You know, when a father is the has a son, they just like, his. this is his son. But, but in Luke, in this case, it says Jesus was, it doesn't just say Jesus was son of Joseph. It says he was son of Joseph according to law. So some think very likely that means he was adopted. I don't think so. I think Joseph really was the son, the father of Jesus. Now, as you know, the Bible says he was born of a virgin. How do I reconcile that? Well, it's the story of Isis and Osiris. Laosiris and Osiris is the same person. We've covered that over and over again. Well, we know that Caesar died. <clears throat> and we know in the Bible, Laosiris died. In Egyptian, Osiris died. And Isis raised up him from the dead. But she did it in a specific way. After he died, okay, so therefore she would be considered a virgin. In other words, no man, no living man had intercourse with her. And she may not have even been married to Caesar, technically. But when Caesar died, just like in the story with Isis and Osiris, when Osiris was killed by Set, just as Osiris was killed by Yahweh, or King Herod or somebody, doesn't say who, but Isis found Osiris's body and found the phallus and somehow whether through, I mean, the, he was dead, but somehow she got some semen and was, and she inserted it in herself and had a child named Horus. We have a story of just like this with Lot and his two daughters. They got him drunk and artificially inseminated themselves. And this became the Moabites, Ammonites and the Moabites. Well, that's interesting because Ruth, that we were just talking about, who was married to Naomi and 
Elimelech's last first, you know, their their son, the king of the Melchizedek line, he died. And then Ruth didn't have, without kids. So Ruth had no kids. So what they did is they performed a liverite marriage and they went and got one close of kin, which was Boaz of the of Judah. So this is why Judah was performing a liberite marriage. So then it's Judah is the scepter, has the scepter now, but he he's not the legal holder. Joseph is. So he'll hold it until Shiloh come. Shiloh is from Ephraim, as we've said. It's in the territory of Ephraim and Joseph. So until this Shiloh come, who is of the territory of Joseph, and this is how we know, because remember, David was the son of Jesse, the Ephraimite. Ephraim is the son of Joseph. So David was from Ephraim. But the reason it's counted through Judah is because they had the Leverite marriage and Boaz stepped in to raise up seed for his brother. This is a Leverite marriage. Well, how could that be? Because even Boaz himself has a genealogy all the way back to Judah. And it doesn't mention anything about any genealogy back to Joseph. Well, here's why. Because in the story, there's several women, not just Ruth. There's Tamar, and there's also a woman named Rahab. Now, Rahab was the harlot in Jericho, as we said. Well, Jericho is like the capital city of the Canaanites, or just a few miles from there. We're not quite sure. Sometimes it's called Shechem, which is also where Dinah went, the daughter of Jacob, and had a daughter, which is the one who ended up marrying Joseph. So Joseph was of the lineage then of Sechem or of the Canaanites, just like all the other people in the story, like Naamah or like Naomi or like Ruth, who was a Moabite and who was artificially, these daughters were virgins and had no sons, but they produced this lineage that came to Christ. So all of these particular children, now this, in the story of Ruth and, and, and the Moabites is to explain that the lineage had to come not only through, from Nahar, but from Terah's line through Abraham. So Abraham is, produces Isaac and then Jacob. But there's another line from Terah, which was through Nahar. And that came down to Lot, which was Abraham's nephew. And so the Bible is not, it's what the Bible's doing, and we're not aware of it, is that the, the lineage of the Messiah would be the lineage of all people. He wouldn't just be from Judah. Judah would just be standing in, in this day and age. But he's constantly marrying the woman, and it's the woman's seed that would become the Messiah, which is both from Cain, it's from Canaanites, it's from the Jericho, which is Canaanites, it's from Moab and Ammon. It's from all these different people. Tamar, the woman's seed. So what, how could then Jesus be from Joseph if it doesn't in Matthew or Luke tell us that it was from Joseph? Well, aside from the Liverite marriage, you can actually read in the text where it says that Solomon married Rahab. Now, I have said that Rahab the harlot married Joshua. Why do I say that? Because the rabbis tell us that. Yeah, we can trust the rabbis. Remember, the Talmud was written by Sanhedrin, by priests, just like the Bible. It's not what we go by because we're going by the New Covenant. We don't go by the Old Covenant anymore. But what they wrote in the Talmud is true. It speaks of Jesus in the Talmud and Mary Magdalene and John the Baptist and all the rest. It's always... they they. What they do is if they don't like a person, they will use a different word. This is how the Bible works. That's why we're telling you about all these different words, like Mary and what it means, and Naomi and what it means. So in the Talmud, it tells us that Rahab, or Joshua, married Rahab. Well, who is Joshua? Joshua has, there's two people that get to go into the Promised Land. All of, Moses didn't get to go, none of the Israelites and that whole, they all died, that generation died, none of them got to go into the promised land. But Joshua and Caleb. Joshua, obviously, is the same name as Jesus. And it doesn't mean Yahshua, but Yeshua or Savior. And so his sidekick was Caleb. Caleb means dog. 
So Joshua then represents Orion and the dog star Sirius. Yeah, it's what rises out of the dew water or the dark part, the bottom part of the wheel and rises up on the horizon in spring. Orion. It's also called Osiris. Orion is a Greek way of saying Osiris. Orion or Orias or whatever. It's, it's just the endings and the syntax. So Joshua is Orion and Caleb is the dog star Sirius. Well, that means that Joshua represents Osiris. Now, remember, as we're saying, <clears throat> Osiris is the Egyptian equivalent of Zeus. And I was saying that all throughout the New Testament, the divine being is written Theos, which is the Attic, Athenian Attic Greek spelling of Zeus. A little more ancient than the Koine Greek, the Attic Greek. And they spelled Zeus Theos. <clears throat> well, then the New Testament speaks of the father, Pater, whose name is Uranus. Well, Uranus was the father of Zeus. So the, the New Testament is very clear that there is the father of the divine beings, who is Uranus, and Zeus, who is also considered like the father. But he had a father himself. This is, would be the great, great, great father. And Jesus talked about Uranus being his father in heaven. Who does that make Zeus? Well, Zeus is the one who saved all mankind, just like Osiris. The equivalent of Zeus is Osiris. I believe Jesus was Zeus in the story, or Osiris, or Yeshua, who married Rahab. Rahab is Rahab the dragon. Guess what? That's Tiamat, time and matter. Yeah. So, Matt, or mother, is Mary Magdalene and Jesus is Zeus and they become the divine couple whose father and mother is Uranus and Gaia. Now, he's known by different names, but how then is it that Luke chapter 21 says that Rahab married Solomon, but the rabbis say that Rahab married Joshua? Well, you got to read it very carefully. The rabbis say that Joshua had no sons with Rahab. He only had daughters. So it, it doesn't have a male line in between because there was no male line. It was the wife. So Rahab's daughter then married Salmon and Salmon gave birth to Boaz. And Boaz then is a lineal descent that goes back to both the high priestess of the Canaanites, just like Joshua, who married uh, the daughter of Dinah and Sechem, which is a Canaanite, just like Noah, who married Naamah, back to Cain. All the lineal descendant or the Melchizedek priesthood is a line that is encompasses both Shem's line, Japheth, and Ham. And we're going to see that when we look in the book of Jubilee. But... That is how Rahab is both the wife of Joshua and that daughter of Salmon who gave birth to Boaz. Now, let's go to Jubilees. <clears throat> And I want to read this to you because it'll really clear up quite a bit. Now, here is the book of Jubilees. Canaan discovers an inscription relating to the sun and stars. His sons, Noah's sons, and Noah divide the earth, Shem's inheritance, Ham's, Japheth's. And that's the explanation for what we're about to read. In verse 1, in the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, in the beginning thereof, Arpachshad, remember Arpachshad is the son of Shem, took to himself a wife, and her name was Rasuja, the daughter of Susan. Now, that's interesting because Susan, which, as it says here, is the daughter of Elam. So, Elam is also of Shem. So, at this point, the lineal descent from Shem or Pakshad is in the one family of Shem, 
We don't have any people from Japheth and we don't have anybody from Ham. Because Susan is the wife, the daughter of Rasuja, the daughter of Elam, which is a uh, from Shem. So our Pakshed's from Shem, and Elam is also from Shem, and so they marry in the family. But Susan is a very important place. It came down as a great capital. Susan was a great city. This is also where the great Ahasuerus reigned. It is also where, remember, Ahasuerus is Osiris. And I don't think that Ahasuerus in the time of Queen Esther was the same Ahasuerus as Osiris from the days of Egypt. But the reason they keep naming them, these kings, in the lineage, see, kings name themselves after their ancestors. It's a priesthood. They take on the title. So Ahasuerus was of the lineage of Osiris. And he marries Queen Esther, which is Easter, Esteroth. And by the way, Mount Ararat, where Noah's boat landed, is spelled in the Ugaritic text, Ashtaroth. So it's Ashtaroth, or Esther, or Easter. It's the Mount of Easter, right? And so Ararat is Estar, or Ashtaroth. But Ararat is also, in our Bibles, Mount Hermon, in the mountain range of Bashan. So people say that Mount Ararat is way up into Turkey. Now, it might be, I don't think it's, this, they don't, it's not the same mountain as Hermon. We don't know exactly which mountain it was where Noah landed, but we know it's in that area. And that is the mountain that's really the mountain in Eden. That was the territory of Eden, which we'll find here proof in Jubilees, but we'll also see it in the Ugaritic text that this Mount Hermon was the mountain of the divine mountain where the two seraphim or the two highest, the, the darkness and the light fought and a portal opened up and they became human. They, they became people because the gate of Hades is there at the base of Mount Hermon. Jesus took his disciples to Mount Hermon and said the gates of hell or Hades will not prevail against my church. And then he had the transfiguration on the mountain, the same mountain. Why is both Jesus and the devil seem to think that that's their mountain? Because that's where the devil made his pact. Well, because that's the, the, the mountain that reaches into the sky. So from heaven they came to earth. From heaven to earth they came. Anunnaki. They came from Anu, the other world. And so the portal to the beneath is to the world. They didn't go under the ground, although you know, or the earth is the highest realm of Sheol. Because remember, the heavens are above where our Uranus is from, on the top side of the wheel. But from earth down, because remember, Jesus said, your father is from beneath. He is from this world. This is the cosmo, the material world, the cosmetic, the, the material world, the earth, and beneath. Now, below the earth is pits and the sea, and below the sea is the abyss. So those are the realms that are beneath. But earth is part of hell, part of Hades. So the angels that fell, they fell from the sky, from the heavens, and they landed on the mountain, which is beneath. And there's a portal there. So Jesus in Isaiah, the morning star, said, I want to make myself like the most high. But Yahweh said, no, I am deity, and there is none else. I am the Savior. I am the I am. But he was the lower I am, the lower ego, the deity, the I am vengeance, the I am jealous, the I am hate. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am love. Two different beings, and they fought upon the mountain, the two seraphim, the six wings each that hover around the Shekinah glory. And one of these angels, Satan, Seth, or Kronos, or Ham, fell like lightning, castrated Uranus, and took over the genealogy. Well, that means that the priesthood is both earthly and spiritual. It has the three parts, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Moses is the physical, but not the carnal. 
Okay, the physical Moses has the lower ego that ruled over him, and that is Yahweh. And so that is why Moses revealed the man of sin or the the son of perdition, Abaddon, the son of destruction, Apollyon. So right now, as we're reading, this Susan is the town of Shushan, which is where Ahasuerus was, and Queen Esther became his wife, and she then is that harlot, or the high priestess, that rides that beast, the governments of the world, and it was Cyrus who is the Messiah in Isaiah. Well, Cyrus and Osiris is the same word. Ahasuerus is just another way of saying it. it, because remember, in Daniel, it goes from Media to Persia, from Babylon, there's three different kingdoms ruling in a very short time. Now, in, partic in these particular different kingdoms, they had different names. So, in uh, Cyrus is the king of Persia, but Media, they called it Ohasuerus. But it's the same person, it's Osiris. And so, Queen Esther then takes the name, is that the same Estarte of the Babylonians? No, but she's still playing the part, Osiris is still playing the part. They're the descendants, they're kings, they're royal, and they are, and they, well, they may even be reincarnations of these people. As we've said, Cleopatra was the reincarnation of Isis. And she had a child named Little Caesar or Isa, Isa, who was the son of Caesar, Osiris. Well, as I said, she really was a virgin. But at the same time, the genealogy came from Joseph. And that's how we know that the book of Luke is a genealogy of Mary all the way back through Judah as the ones who will reign on earth, who perform the Liverite marriage and raise up seed for the true heir, which is the Melchizedek priesthood. So the Levitical priesthood is just an appendage. The Melchizedek is the highest. And Jesus, remember, Jesus' brother, J uh, James, was called James the Just. Another way of saying that, it's just the way it's come down to us, the just is also the righteous. And righteous in Hebrew is Zadok. So James the, the, the righteous was of the lineage of the Melchizedek. He held the Melchizedek priesthood because just as Jesus did, as it says in the book of Hebrews, and just as King David did, the son of the Ephraimite, from Ephraim, who is of the city of Shiloh, which is just a few miles from Jericho, where the original Yeshua, Joshua, Osiris, married the high priestess, the harlot, which is a holy. That's what the word harlot is. In Hebrew, the word harlot means holy. It means a holy priestess. And so Rahab the harlot was not a harlot. She was a holy priestess of the line of Canaan, of the Melchizedek priesthood. So so Susan was was on the river Tigris, at the base down by where the Tigris met the Euphrates. And it was a great, huge, amazing city. And you've heard in the Bible, the Shulamite woman, or the Shunamite woman. Well, that's the Susan. And the, the Shunamite woman was raised up. Okay? Remember, Eliu or Elias raised up the widow's son? This is the priesthood that he raised up. And Jesus raised up the, the widow named her child. And it, again, it means that Jesus came to raise up the true priesthood. So now, she bare him a son in the third year of the week and called his name Canem. Well, they spell it all different ways depending on what translation were. So, this is the book of Jubilees, and I don't know who translated this, but it's really Canem. And so, why is there a Canaan in there? Because our Bible doesn't mention a Canaan. It mentions Arpachshad, the son of Shem. But Arpachshad's son is supposed to be Shiloh, which is where the city of Salem got its name, which is the priesthood of Shem, Arpachshad, and Canaan. And remember, Canaan finds this pyramid with all his writing, and we'll get to that here in a minute. And so, the son grew, Canaan, and his father taught him writing. And he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. Why does he have to seize a place? 
for a city because it's Canaan and the Canaanites didn't have authority there according to Yahweh, right? Because Yahweh is only representing the interests of the flesh. Now, as we're going to find out that there is a right, the rightful heir to that land, the most glorious land, the great promise, the promised land, is a child of Shem and of Japheth and of Ham, all three. Just like Noah had seed from Cain. They all get an inheritance, even if in this physical world, the flesh is weak. But we'll see all this that I'm saying here as we read. So why would he then have to uh, find him or seize himself a place for a city? Because Noah divided up the world between his three sons. They knew where they lived and they didn't have to seize it or steal it or fight or war. They were given the land by lot, just like Israel when they went into the promised land. They were given the land by lot. And they were not supposed to fight amongst each other to seize each other's territory. Well, Yahweh did. He tried to seize the land from the Canaanites because because he didn't understand. He was blind. He was the lower carnal self. And he, that was the lineal, the male line of the carnal and he did not understand that he was not the only one. He was blind. He thought he was the divine one. I am God and there is none else. You will bow down and worship me. I am jealous. I am vengeance. So he said, kill all the Canaanites. But he didn't understand. Right? He cursed Cain. But our Heavenly Father made sure Cain got through through Naamah. And we have her represented, the woman's seed, who would bring forth the Messiah. So, verse 3 and he found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock. And he read what was therein. And he transcribed it. So he wrote it down in a book. This is the story of Adam and all the, the story of Atlantis. I'm sure what we have, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, New Numbers, Deuteronomy, all this, is excerpts from this book, Jubilees, and from the original book of Adam and from the book of Enoch, which was written in the stone or in the Great Pyramid. And he found it, and he transcribed it into a book. So we have pieces of it to this day called the Bible. And sinned owing to it, for it contained the teaching of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and the moon and the stars in all the signs of heaven. In other words, astrology. This was forbidden knowledge according to Yahweh. And he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it. For he was afraid to speak to Noah about it, Anu, his father, Anu, lest he should be angry with him on account of it. And in the thirtieth jubilee, in the second week, in the first year of thereof, he took unto himself a wife, and her name was Melka. Now that, then, is Melchizedek. You know, Melech Zadok. Where does the Melech come from? From this Canaan's wife. Because Canaan... Who is Canaan? Well, he's the son of Arpachshad, full-blood child. But the Masoretic scribes leave his name out. And so therefore, if you read in the King James or any other version of the Bible today, you won't find it, only in the Septuagint. And we know it's supposed to be there because it's in the book of Luke, the woman's seed, Mary. So, Melchah was the daughter of Medai, Medai the son of Japheth. So now they're going to have a child that's both of Shem and Japheth. Remember what we talked about yesterday. Japheth got the Isles of the Sea, or Poseidon got the sea, and he, his last son was Gog of Magog, this giant that came down through the portal. And that was one of his last sons that come up out of the bottomless pit. In other words, they were titans that reigned from the days of Atlantis, these demigods. Well, they sinned, they, they forsook their natural estate, meaning that they were not supposed to marry, of, according to Yahweh, they were not supposed to marry the Canaanites. Well, Noah did, didn't he? And there is divine intervention, and then there is rebellion. So, when Kronos castrated his father Uranus, that was because he wanted to take over the world and be the only lineal descendant. So, that wasn't approved of. They forsook and they fell in there. From heaven to earth they came and had relations to the daughters of men. In other words, they were in a heavenly higher 
ruling class among men of Japheth. Japheth was the firstborn. They weren't supposed to marry Dan, the Titans. Then they became a married mortal, or in other words, children from Naoma, children from Naomi or from Cain. They weren't supposed to marry the Canaanites, according to Yahweh. And if they did, then they become demigods. In other words, they weren't of that high rank, the highest rank from Noah or from before the flood. And they, they were considered half divine and half from Cain because the Canaanites were from Cain. And we'll see why here in a minute. And so now we've got Japheth in the picture. So the Melchizedek, Zadak, meaning the, the righteous priesthood from Mother Melka, begot a son and called his name Shelah. That's where they set up the high priesthood of Salem or Shelah or Shiloh until Shiloh come or the descendant who is this Shelah, which is taken out of Canaan, is taken out of the Masoretic text. We don't know who Shelah is. You know, it says uh, Judah will have the scepter until Shiloh come, but we don't know who Shiloh is. Shiloh was the son of Ephraim, who is son of Joseph, who is the son of Sechem, the Canaanite, who is a descendant of this Canaan, the Canaanite. The Melchizedek, his mother being Melchah, of this high priesthood from Shem. So he said, for he said, truly I have been sent. And in the fourth year he is born, and Shelah grew up and took to himself a wife, and her name was Muak, the daughter of Kesab, his father's brother, in the one and thirtieth jubilee in the fifth week. And she bare him a son in the fifth year, and therefore, and called his name Eber. Now this is where we get the Hebrews. So the Hebrews are both from Japheth and Shem. And this is why it says that Japheth shall dwell in his tent. They will tabernacle in the same tent. They, be, they will be mixed, and that was approved of. But there's one child that was not approved because he castrated his father. That's Kronos or Ham. So we'll get to that. And so he, this kid named Eber took unto himself a wife, and her name was Azarad, the daughter of Nibrod. Now, again, it's not spelled the same way, but very, very close. But if you look this up, that word, in the dictionary, you'll say it's Nimrod. Nimrod is one of the sons of Ham. So now the lineal priesthood of Melchizedek has three genealogies, one to Shem, one to Japheth, and one to Ham. Well, Nimrod became a mighty one. Mighty one is Giborim, also translated giant. But it's not. it doesn't stop there. He became a mighty hunter before the Lord. The mighty hunter is Orion, otherwise known as Osiris. Or King, the Tsar, the Caesar, the great leader of mankind, the great high priest. Why is he why is the story of Nimrod and Miriamus the same as the story of Osiris and Isis? Because this Melchizedek priest Osiris or Nimrod is a descendant of Shem and of Japheth and of Ham. The problem is, is the lower part, the material fell yeah, and began to worship the lower ego, Yahweh. The two deities that are around the light and the darkness and they began to worship the darkness and this is what caused the being to fall, they usurp the authority of the higher consciousness. So, in the 32nd Jubilee, in the seventh week, in the third year thereof. So this is the Melchizedek priesthood. And at some point, it comes down. Remember, it, it was a, considered a tree. The high priesthood was considered a tree. And in Ezekiel, it says, take from the tender branches at the top of the tree, which is the, remember, Jesus is the Nazarene or the branch the tender branch. And there were several branches. Nebuchadnezzar, a descendant of Nimrod, was also considered by the Midrash and the rabbis to be a son of Solomon, of the son of the line of David. So the royal bloodline had to be through 
Judah, but they were just taking the place, as we said, of the Melchizedek priesthood. So, in the sixth year, she bare him a son and called his name Peleg, for in his days when he was born, the children of Anu, Noah, began to divide the earth amongst themselves. So, Anu divided up the world between his three sons. Uranus divided up the world between his three sons too. Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus. But you see there in the Greek story, we see a little, this, we see this in a different light. Because in the Bible, Noah divides the, the world. Now, Poseidon still gets the sea, but it's the isles of the sea, right? So it's a little different. They're, they're actual three kids and they live on the earth and they just divide up the world. But Uranus divides up the world between Zeus, the sky, Poseidon, the sea, and Hades is the underworld. So, that gives you an idea. There are not... <laughs> What is this Hades? What is what is the sky? We were talking about the sky opened and Uranus spoke. Well, is it the sky or is it a person? Well, it's really a person. It goes back to a person who has authority over a certain part of the earth. Descendants of humans who had specific priesthoods. So now, um, this is, and so this is Peleg. And in his days, the earth was divided. That's the days, days of Babylon. This is the days of Nimrod, you see. We just spoke of him, Nimrod. Now, it looks like we are up past an hour. So I want to kind of bring this to a conclusion. We're not going to be able to go into much deeper here. But what I wanted to share with you is that there are so many people that are saying that there are, I've been saying that Jesus uh, is actually from Joseph. He is the Shiloh that's in the territory of Ephraim and Joseph that that the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the true priesthood that goes back to Shem, Japheth, and Ham and is divinely appointed and would be of the woman's seed through Cain, through the woman, and of the male line through Noah. Noah then was considered the father of the divine beings. And his firstborn son, Japheth, was of the divine being. But they fell. They fell on that mountain. And this is the story in Ezekiel 28, where the Nakash, or the serpent, or the shining one, the bright and morning star, not Jesus, but the one who fell. I saw Satan fall like lightning, Jesus said. He fell upon that mountain and came into this earthly realm but it's another story. It's telling two different stories. It's telling an esoteric story about sin and our spirit and our higher consciousness. And it's also telling a literal story about a group of individuals that were literally humans, that were the firstborn sons that had the right to rule, that rebelled and married the Canaanites, which was the material lower slave people. And they weren't supposed to do that. Well, in our Heavenly Father's plan, there are no slaves. The flesh is going to have a marriage with the Spirit. And they're going to live in perfect harmony. So this is the great wedding that the book of Revelation is talking about. We'll get into more of what that really means, this wedding. Because there's a lot more that we could talk about, but we're running out of time. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it there, guys. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Maybe the Lord bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.